Just Branding. Just Branding. Podcast. Hello, folks. Welcome to Just Branding. Today, we have a very exciting guest. A superstar of workshop design is with us. Her name is Brittany Bowering. And I met Brittany, had the privilege of meeting Brittany um, in Faro in Portugal, where we were both uh, privileged to be speakers at an event put on by my good friend uh, Rui called Design FAO. Just put that to one side for a second. But we found ourselves in uh, at a table with lots of other speakers and hung out for a, for a good couple of evenings. And it was really good fun. And I just thought to myself as we were talking that, e- that evening and the evenings after, Brittany has some awesome stuff that you folks at home today need to hear about workshop design. So we're not specifically going to focus on brand today, although that will definitely play into it, but more the principles of how you can actually kind of create something that's of high value to your clients when you think about brand. So we're going to tuck into Brittany's mind in just a minute, just to say that she is the ex-head of brand at an agency some of you might know called AJ Smart, who really kind of championed the sprint methodology. So I think um, that just gives you a bit of background there. She's also got a background in marketing and various agencies, lots of experience, which I won't bore everybody with. Not, I'm sure it's not boring, Brittany, but it'll be boring if I tell it. I'd rather hear it from you. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Matt. Matt and Jacob, thanks for having me. Yeah, don't forget, Jacob, you get lonely. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. But yeah, Matt's doing the intro today. Jacob, you're looking brilliant today. You've got a lot of um, beautiful, I don't know, high resolution like lighting going on. I need to. I do. I have a new setup. So yeah, it's um, got the green screen. I got the light in, and I learned as a hair light now. So yeah, it's it's a new gear for 2023. And it looks like you've seen the sun now also recently, which is nice. (laughs) Yeah, it's summer down here, so in Sydney. Beautiful. (laughs) Good stuff. Good stuff. Right. Well, let's let's um let's tuck into this. Uh, Brittany, as I said, it would be boring if if um if I told your story because it'd be better to hear it from you. I think let's focus in on how you got into workshopping, if we can call it that. What's the story there? Um and t- tell us about your first experiences and, and and how things have gone since. It's probably been like six or seven years, I guess, um, that I've been really kind of diving into it. And it was all through actually the agency that you mentioned, AJ and Smart, um, and through the design sprint. So that was actually my first introduction. Um, If you've never heard of a design sprint, it's basically a workshop, a very intense workshop process where you go from having kind of a big challenge to um, a user or consumer tested prototype of a solution or several solutions. Um, So it's it's very well structured. It's, um, you know, you take a group of people and you walk them through these very specific exercises to an incredible outcome in just four or five days, kind of depending on how you run it. Um, So immediately when I saw that in action, I thought, this is brilliant. Um, More people need to be working like this. Um, I love the efficiency of it. I loved the fact that, you know, we were all so focused. There was no context switching. There was tons about it that I just loved. And um, and I was coming from sort of working um, in more like marketing, advertising, branding for kind of tech, a lot of tech startups, actually. So I was living in Berlin at the time and, you know, tech scene was blowing up. Um, so I was working with a lot of these companies that sort of were coming up with ideas and, you know, these startups were were kicking off and it sort of like felt like their ideas weren't really validated or the thing they wanted to do. I was like, does anybody want this? Does anybody actually need this? Um, and through the design sprint, I discovered like the perfect method for sort of testing those things before investing heavily in a certain idea um, or solution. So I just, I just loved it, found it super valuable. I'm also, I have a little bit of a like I, a little bit of a mathematical brain. So I love the kind of like, oh, the I, I love the connections of the exercises and this super structured way of working. Um, yeah. So I guess that's kind of how I originally found it. Matt, I know you have a plan with questions and whatnot, but I really want to know how a, a sprint works. Like what's the, how does it work? Yeah, this is a great question. And I have a lot of passion around it. So actually, you know, I've been running a lot lately brand like more brand focused sprints so i'm happy to talk about those as well you're on the right podcast yeah exactly <laughs> um and some really powerful stuff coming out of these sprints so it's really quite quite a cool method so basically um what happens is you have a big 
business challenge. It can be around a product, like a digital product. That's where the, the process actually originated was sort of in the digital product space, but now it's expanded to basically, you know, I know people running like human resources sprints, um, you know, sprints around um, obviously marketing campaigns, um, sprints around just brand itself as well. So ton, like honestly, any space where you have a big business challenge and the key with the design sprint and actually with workshops in general, I feel is you bring, you're bringing people like a cross functional team together. So you, you're definitely bringing people from different sides of the business who have sort of, um, you know, different ideas and different views of the space. Um, so you're bringing those people together in a room, um, I've done it virtually as well, but I think the design sprint works best when you're in the room together. Um, for now, four days is how I run it. Some people do five days, but I do it for four days. First day is all about aligning on the challenge. Um, everybody really kind of like focusing in on what are we working, what are we working on here. Then in the afternoon, already on day one, we're we've kind of switched into idea mode. So we're producing solutions on that very challenge. And the the cool thing about um, the way that the sprint works is that everybody's kind of working on their own. So the idea really is that we kind of like we we align together, but then we produce solutions alone, um, all with the same information, with the same inspiration. But the the whole point is that you know, there's no group think happening, right? We're really able to come up with a lot of different solutions, right? And then kind of narrow our focus. So already on day one, we're solution building. Day two, we decide on one, two, I've even prototyped like five solutions, depending on how, what we're looking to achieve. But um, we decide on what we're going to go forward with and create um, and put into a prototype. So that happens on day two, the very exciting day. Um, then day three is prototyping day. So that's where we are really actually building high fidelity prototypes in one day. The goal is as high fidelity as possible in that one day that we can do with our team. So you want to kind of, when you're testing with consumers, the idea is really that they kind of forget that they're looking at a prototype. Ideally, they don't even know that it's a prototype and they just think you're testing something that literally, literally exists or legitimately exists. Then day four, probably the best day is um, the testing day. So you bring in five consumers, just five or users, depending on who you said. It's so funny because I'm working with a lot of different companies and some of them say users, some of them say consumers. So Anyway, but you bring in five people who are your target audience and you do qualitative testing with them. So it's like 45 minutes to an hour is each test. You're showing them the stimulus. You're walking them through things. You're getting them talking about what they're seeing, what they think, you know, their emotions. It's really, you're getting deep with the consumer. So you're, um, you're getting these like really juicy insights. Um, and then at the end of the day, you have basically this huge wall of feedback about your ideas and you're able then to figure out which direction you should go into, um, which, what iterations you need to make to that idea, to that direction, right? Cause it's, it's not about finding the perfect solution. It's about finding the right insights and then being, being well on your path, you know, well on your way to actually getting to the place that you want to be. Um, so that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, I hope that was coherent enough without visuals. Usually I have like visuals and you can see the agenda <laughs> and everything. <laughs> what I love about that, and this is why I think this is helpful to 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 the to our audiences. I think a lot of people could see a lot of synergy with the design sprint and how we would build brands. You know, a lot of people would build brands. The the I've been using sprints and, and workshops for a while. I think the the benefit is exactly what you said. It just saves so much time if you can get people in the room and actually get cross functions talking together. Isn't it funny? Like one of the biggest yeah. challenges in business is just the siloed um, behavior often structure um, gives gives companies. So kind of helping them break that down. They love it as well. People absolutely love it when you can get them in the room and uh, and they can focus, as you pointed out, around something like an exciting thing, like finding the next direction for, for the big challenge. So yeah, I, I think this is an uh, awesome. Um, there's a book, isn't there? By uh, is it by a, a chap called Knapp? If I can't remember, Jake Knapp is it? Is Jake it? Jake Knapp, remember. yes, Jake yes. Knapp. Good old Jake. I don't know Jake Knapp. We'd love to have him on the show if you know him, Brittany. Mention us to him, won't you? But he's written a great book called Sprint. So if you want to know more depth um, on Sprint, uh, Sprint workshops and, and design sprints, 
definitely I would su- suggest check check that out. Okay, so cool. Um, I think what where I wanted to sort of shift to was where you've sort of gone, because you mentioned sprints are just one part of what you do. I mean, workshops is the more, more broader kind of approach. So when you um, when you kind of uh, think about a workshop, how first of all, how would you define a workshop? And when is a workshop a good idea to deploy and when it's not? Mm-hmm. So I think a workshop, gosh, this is the question I actually, I don't think I've ever been asked, like what defines a workshop? And I think it's what great. Is a workshop? Yeah, what is a definitions workshop? definitions on this show, actually. Yeah, we often okay. talk about definitions. Perfect. Well, then I would um, define a workshop as, um, so a workshop is definitely having, like you have more than like a, maybe more than three plus people, let's say. Three people would be a very small workshop in my eyes, but you have a group of people. Um, you have a, um, a tangible outcome. So I think one key thing about workshops is it's not about like, you know, um, like there's always going to be something happening at the end and there's going to be a follow-up. So there's always going to be an outcome, whether it's new ideas, whether it's, um, you know, creating a, a, a solution for something specific, whether it's even just like a simple, um, like kind of like random brainstorm, as long as it's very clear on like what the tangible outcome is, I think then it's a workshop. Um, Also, I think that, a couple of things you need to think about or a couple of things that would to me would define a workshop would be that you're doing exercises together. So there's kind of like a sense of we're working together on this. Um, if you could do it outside of the room, like on, everybody on their own, then I would say that's not really workshop worthy or it's not even really a workshop altogether. So definitely it's about working together towards some kind of desired outcome. How's yeah, that? Are, what do you think? That's good. That's good. I think you. I think you could get that down to three, three or four words personally. But we'll, we'll work on that. You know, that, that's, that's not my thing, man. That's what I do. You know, I just everything is takes much longer. Right. No, no, no. It's fine. It's helpful. I think you're right. You you had a number of kind of criteria there, which is super helpful for folks. I think I think the other thing is is uh, you mentioned what everything else is not a workshop. It's just work, isn't it? Right. So workshopping is way more fun. You get everybody together, focused around a desired outcome. I think that's awesome. So when would you say that kind of uh, that that kind of work is necessary? You know, why why would we pull people away from their everyday individual sort of activity? to come together, when is that a good idea to do? Yeah, that's a great question because I think what happens a lot with people who have, you know, not experienced, not done a lot of workshops is they'll do one and then they get really excited and they're like, that was so fun. That was so awesome. That's how we're going to work forever, you know? And and (laughs) then you start having the series of like, you're invited to workshops every day of the week. Um, And that is too much, right? We can't, it's just simply uh, too much energy to be working in that format all the time. Um, But I would say that the keys to, uh, you know, when to workshop is, is the challenge a big one? So is it like risky? Is it going to be expensive? You know, if you make the wrong decision, is it going to be expensive? Is it, um, is it something where a second thing would be, is it something where we need more hands on deck, right? So we need people maybe coming from different sides of the business, or just we need the whole team together, right? Um, One thing that I think often happens with challenges where people are like, oh, I have this. Yeah. Okay. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do a workshop and they just sort of of like bring people together. It's like, do those people need to be there? Right. It's sort of something that needs, you need to think about like who actually will provide value for this, for this challenge. So making sure you have the right people there. Um, And then I think the other thing that you need to think about is well, like, like, what is the challenge, right? So a good workshop challenge is often when you aren't sure where to go next, or you feel like the team is a little bit misaligned right now about, you know, what our next steps are, or, you know, if you see your team sort of everybody doing their work, but it's not sort of adding up and, and coming together, this is a really good time to bring people in and reassess and have a workshop. Um, so, you know, there are there are times when it's definitely much better to do one and there's like not everything can be solved in a workshop so yeah i think it's a great question and one we need to think about a lot more often i love i love that Brittany. i i i'll tell you I, I don't know if this is helpful at all to folks but when i first came across workshops it was about i don't know it was about 10 years ago and i was running this agency and one thing we used to find as i'm sure a lot of 
you, we all find with design work because it, it was a design agency was misalignment with the with the client right and i had this chap who was working for me paul good old paul paul allen shout out um and he he said to me um why don't we have like a workshop at the start of every project and i was like what is this newfangled workshop thing um you speak of anyway i i said yeah sure like um you know if you want to run something like that sounds sounds interesting so i sat in and what he did was uh, classic workshopping he brought all of our our kind of uh, project team in and he brought the client's project team in and only for like an hour or something and i was just like blown away because th- those projects that we started to run from then on in were just super aligned with the client there wasn't any mismatch my team understood it the client's team understood it everyone had a name to a face and it, and from there i kind of realized the value of workshops and then built up built up and now as you say you're in workshops for a couple of days sometimes so it's um it's definitely powerful to bring alignment everybody's minds um, are so independent, aren't they? And we, you need something to fuse them together. Otherwise, it's chaos sometimes. So yeah, so that's how I saw it. It's a great point about the alignment. The fact that you spent day one just diagnosing the problem that you're going to solve just shows how important that phase is. Like, why are people in the room? What are we trying to solve here? Um, yeah. And you know, it can get it be really expensive, as you said, to get all these leaders in a room. And if they're going to be there for four days, like that's it's quite a, a big chunk of time. So how do you actually get um, people in the room that have to be there and convince them, right, that it's going to be worth their time? Excellent question. So I think that something that happens a lot with design sprints, because they're, like you said, they're four days and four days is basically a week. And that's an insane amount of time for people to carve out of their already very busy schedules, especially because with the design sprint, you want to have, you need to have leadership there on some level. And so their schedules are often, of course, the busiest and uh, the hardest to sort of, you know, move around. So the thing about the design sprint specifically is that you have to have leadership on board. So there's no like, it's very difficult to be like, okay, you know, on the ground, we're going to run a design sprint and then invite leadership to it without sort of already having a proof of concept for them. Um, the key is that you convince them of the power of the workshop and the the value um, that their time in that room is going to bring. So what I you never want to do is run a workshop or, I mean, a design sprint specifically, you can run a workshop without leadership in the room, but but design sprints, you definitely want to have your, there's a key role called a decider. And it, this is the person who could basically, once you kind of come up with a solution at the end, could like kibosh the whole thing and be like, nope, we're not doing that. Um, it's the person who has sort of this strategic background of the company and sort of the direction. And then also basically the the one person who could uh, uh, who could shape the, the future of whatever it is we're sprinting on. Right. So convincing them is the most difficult part for sure. What I like to do if it's like leadership's not on board the sprint yet. Um, I would personally, if I, if it were my team and I was like in the company and I was like, I really want to des- run a design sprint. I think it'd be really powerful. I would start by running and inviting this leadership person to like a really short session because a lot can happen in a super short set, like an hour. Right. Um, like invite them to something where you want to like maybe do some def- defining of a challenge specifically um, and just prove to them the value of it. I mean, the other thing, of course, is leadership loves case studies. They love to see what's worked for other companies. And there are a ton of um, case studies out there around the power of the design sprint and what companies have actually achieved with it. And that, to me, it's like leadership always needs to know what are we going to get out of it? So you can come to them with those case studies and be like, this company did this, this company did this. And it just, that is very, very convincing. So that's sort of my method for it. But to be honest, I personally, as a workshop facilitator, love and and sort of I, I kind of try to keep this as a rule is I only go into companies and run like design sprints or, or that length of a workshop if leadership is on board. So if it's kind of like coming from leadership, because if it's not, it's an absolute nightmare. Yeah, It always fails as my experience yeah. or pretty much. Um, because you can't make decisions and you can't move forward. And what happens then is probably the worst possible outcome is that everyone's super excited. They've come together. They've got some ideas, some solutions, and then they're looking to push forward. 
um, and then um, it gets canned. And then when that happens, you know, you, people get demoralized. I've seen it happen a couple of times where people literally have quit, you know, like, well, that was it, right? I'm gone because I put all my heart and soul into this idea and it's just, it's just been canned. So I think, I think people need to be careful when they go down that route, because as you've rightly pointed out, I think people need to see outputs, positive outputs and progress it. Otherwise, what's yeah. the point, right? You've just wasted everybody's life. <laughs> so... The thing is with this, with leadership is they're always the most excited about the design sprint. Yeah, like once hard. you get the opportunity, right. To kind of like tell them about it or when they experience it, like this last one I ran, I ran last week in, in the U S with a big corporate company and leadership was there. And um, like the right leadership was in the room. Um, and we also actually brought them in, brought in another sort of leadership panel, which is something that I sometimes do with, with kind of these bigger organizations where they really need input from actually several different people. Um, but they, at the end, they were just like, uh, they were blown away. Like they could not believe what we'd achieved in four days. And they just kept saying it. They were like, that was just amazing. And that now they're talking about it with all of their other, you know, leadership people being like, hey, have you heard of this thing? Like we got more done in four days than we have ever got done in like six months of work. So it's pretty powerful stuff. It so is. I, I, I ran one, I think it was a year back, where we took a leadership team um, and, and we designed it, you know, like you've sort of mentioned, but we took a team through from concept right the way through to actual working prototypes of the 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 design of the brand the tone of tone of voice of the brand like actually some of the execution stuff and along the way we had i think we had on a couple of the days um like a, a steering group check-in with um custom a, a, a kind of a group that represented the customer and another one with a group that represented partners of this organization like other partner organizations and the feedback if you plan it you can just, the momentum is just mental. I mean, I was knackered at the end, you know, as, as, oh, you, yeah. know, as, as you say, it takes up huge energy from a facilitation perspective, but the output in such a short space of time was, it blew, it staggered, you know, it was staggering, you know, what we achieved and the buy-in, right? Because people, the decision makers are there, they understand everything, they're in the moment, nothing distracts. And then we can press press forward. So I think I think it's the future for 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 you know for agile kind of speedy um, joined up thinking. If you've not done it, try it. You know, as I say, Brittany yes. Brittany's the expert at it. So um, you know, this is great. So I've got a couple more questions though. Um, you, I've mentioned like something that I've done. I pull bits and bobs together to kind of design something. You do that all the time on a next level. Talk to us about how you actually go about designing a workshop for a for a client and maybe some tips maybe your top three tips or something yeah so i think that the key for when you're kind of set out setting out to design a workshop is kind of two for me it's like i need to know two things one is where are we at right now right so what's the challenge and where are we currently and where do we want to go right what is the and i like to be as like tangible as possible and i find sometimes when you're talking to people, it's, you have to ask several times, like, what exactly do we want to get out of that? And maybe that's coaching from my side where, you know, I'll help them decide what they should get out of this workshop, but it's so important to have that very clear. So it's like, you know, for example, um, I worked with a client and they were like, okay, well, we have this technology, right? We have this technology, we have a great brand, you know, People know this brand and we have this new technology. We're not exactly sure. We've got some ideas, but we're not exactly sure where to go with it. What to, what kind of product it should, you know, be involved in. So it's like, okay, cool. That's a cool starting point. Very clear. That's the challenge. Right. And then it's like, what is our output? What do we want to get out of it? Okay. We decided that what we wanted to have out of it were three ideas for what this technology could look like in a product form tested with consumers, right? So that's a design sprint challenge, but, you know, um, it could be like, maybe the, the outcome was going to be more like, oh, we just want like five new ideas and we want to put them into quant tests, right? So it's like that just testing with like a ton of different consumers, like hundreds of thousands, right? So it's like, it could be a couple of different things, but what's super important is that you're very, very clear about that. In saying that, also very important is that 
everyone on the team is very clear about that. So I know we're talking about designing and not necessarily about like onboarding the team, but it's so important um, from the get-go that everybody involved in your workshop knows why they're there. So it's like everybody understands where the challenge is at. Everybody understands where we're going to take it, right? So it's like getting that, you know, support, getting the getting the alignment on that is the, your first step for sure. Then what I try to think about is um, like if we're talking more like sort of like the the getting gathering together of the exercises and sort of like thinking about your sort of flow, um, I like to basically think about okay, in terms of alignment on the challenge, how much how much deeper do we need to go there? Do I need to do you know a few things? Is it actually like pretty much done and we can jump right into solutions? Um, what does that kind of look like, right? And then I have sort of a, a toolkit of exercises that I grab and take from and and piece that together. For me, a really great workshop is like, oh, it's this is kind of a design thinking thing, which is another concept that is interesting to look at if you're interested in workshops. But it's sort of like opening and then closing. So first you open, you get lots of ideas or you talk a lot about the challenge and then you focus. So it's all about creating these two sort of um, moments. So moment for exploration, everybody, you know, really kind of talking widely about something and then narrowing down and focusing in. So it's like all your exercises are around that. Um, so then I kind of piece things together. If I'm doing something really creative, like um, a company wanted to, we, we did this where we came up with some kind of brand, like almost like branding concepts, but we brought them to life in a, um, almost like a marketing campaign. So it was like, how are we going to talk this new products launching? How are we going to talk about it? What are, what's the, you know, what's the general messaging? How are people, how are we going to explain it? Right. So it was kind of around marketing and branding, getting people who are not necessarily, you know, creative directors from big agencies to come up with ideas that make sense and are tying back to our challenge and our product and our brand is tricky. Right. So you have to really like, handhold a little bit and create a safe environment with exercises that are easy to understand, but will slowly progress to, you know, where you want to go. So it's like, you know, if I want people to write a script for um, an advertisement, I might do a couple of different things around, you know, words, and I would, you know, maybe do some kind of like storytelling exercises. Um, so it's all about sort of Figuring out where you need to go and how much guidance does your team need in order to get there? A couple of tips, though, quick and dirty tips. They're not dirty at all, but they're quick. OK, so, <laughs> so what I said was know your goal and make sure the entire team knows it. So alignment on your goal is very, very key. Um, having the right people in the room, very, very important. Um, plan down to the minute. So this and, and OK, so this might come as a surprise because you, I, I believe in planning down to the minute and then having a plan B, C, and D in case you are running ahead of time, running over time, right? Um, you need to basically, like for me, especially later in my workshop, I'll have, um, I'll have an idea of like, okay, this is the exercise I want to do. Now, if we're running over time, I'm going to shorten it. And here's the exercise I'm going to do, the kind of shortened version. And if we're running ahead of time, which almost never happens, but sometimes it does, then I'll do an expanded version of it, right? Or I'll add another exercise in. So I've always got ways to kind of pivot or like, you know, flexibility is important, but planning is so important. Um, and then the last one that I think um, Matt and I talked a lot about is for me, it's so important to think about a powerful start, a really, you know, exciting event happening in the middle of your workshop, and then a really awesome ending to your workshop. So this is like creating these highlight moments throughout your workshop is what is going to keep people energized, keep them engaged, keep them motivated. And it's what at the end of the day, they're going to remember. So they're going to remember that stuff. And then maybe they're going to go and run around and talk to other people about how great your workshop was, which is the ideal scenario. Um, or, you know, best also another great outcome is that they just feel excited about their work. Um, and that's kind of, for me, the reason I love facilitation, I love workshops, I love hosting these things, is it really gets people excited and engage, engaged again in what they're doing. I, I love that. I think that 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 point around experience, you know, I, I often think as a, as a facilitator, your job is 
to lift the experience, right? To heighten the experience. So it's positive because people, people, you know, if you could, I always often said, well, I often think if you could make your workshop the best thing that that, that all of those people do that month, that is your job, right? So that they, as you say, go around talking about it, but it's the best meeting. They feel excited. They get great outcomes, but they have a good time while doing it. It's fun, right? And that's what it yeah. should be. Work should be fun if we're doing it properly. So I, I love that. Um, in terms of those moments, you mentioned like the the, the, the peak moments. So the great start, I think you said in the middle, there's a, there's a good one. And at the end, how do you go about kind of selecting what to put in for those moments? And yeah. have you got any kind of examples or tips that you could share with the group, with, with the group, with the audience um, around, around, uh, around what that sort of looks like? Cause I know you're, you're super keen on those, on, on those moments. This is like one of my favorite things before I run a workshop, I literally take time and I sit down and I'm like, okay, how can I make them like smile or make them or surprise them with something, you know, they weren't expecting this, like you said, the re this really is what is going to give them that experience feeling, the feeling that we're not just in another meeting. So what I like to do, or let, well, I'll just use last week, for example, what I did last week. So um, I was coming from Germany, right? I'm Canadian, but I live in Germany. Um, I was coming from Germany to the US um, to run this workshop. So I thought, I'm going to bring a bunch of like weird German sweets to the, to the workshop, you know, like the stuff that they can't find in the U S and it's kind of fun and it's, you know, interesting and new. So I brought all that stuff. So when they came into the room, they had, you know, the workshop space all set up and then like, like this overflow of sweets super small thing that it was very achievable and easy for me to do, but added this extra layer of like, Oh, and everybody, everybody had the exact same response. And it was like, Oh, that's so nice of you to bring this stuff from so far away. You know, like you thought about it and you brought it with you. And it's like, it was a very easy thing for me to do, but it was thoughtful. And it was like, I knew, and I was like, yeah, I know you guys, you guys have these, I know in the U S but the German version is better because of, you know, and it's like, it's a little conversation starter and it's a cute little thing. And then I gave them all some candy to also like take home with them and to their kids and stuff. Right. So cute little thing. Right. Okay. So that was the, that was the, um, the, the start, right. Then, um, I did this after the first day, um, because the first day of a design sprint is very exhausting. I mean, all days are exhausting, but I feel like the first day, cause everybody's not used to you know, this way of working, it's always a bit intense. So at the end of the first day, I gave everybody um, a book. Do I have one here? Yeah, I have it right here. Um, and I, you know, I was thinking like, I could give them the sprint book, you know, which I love, by the way, Jake Knapp is amazing. That book is incredible. You should read it if you're interested in workshop. But I thought, okay, I'm going to give them something that's like, you know, even if you don't want to facilitate workshops is interesting. So I brought everybody a copy of Steel Like an Artist by Austin Cleons. Um, actually, I gave them two different ones, but this is like a, it's a, a book about creativity and sort of how to kind of like use creativity in your everyday. And it's like the perfect little book to keep on your desk whenever you're feeling a little bit like blah, right? So I just gave them all of this. I put a little bow on it. Like I wrapped in a little bit of this. I gave them to them at the end of the day when they were like really exhausted, right? And they were all like, oh my God, that was intense. And I'm like, congrats on a cheat, you know, a successful first day. I'm going to give you this. And I just gave a little spiel and they were all just like, oh my gosh, you know, that's so sweet. Again, they're surprised. They weren't expecting it, you know, um, simpler things you can do for like, and that's an end of day thing. Right. But a simpler thing you can do, which we also do a lot in the sprint is like a quick one as well is like, what's one word that you would use to describe how you're feeling right now or how the day went for you. And everybody goes around and says one word. And usually the words are very positive, right? Because they, they're excited and they're, you know, they might even say, oh, my word is exhausted, but in a good way, because we got so much done, you know, and there's this like playful niceness and you remind them of, it's all about kind of reminding them of the, 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 the positive side or the, you know, what they achieved and all that stuff. So this is the whole thing. Like, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different things you can do and, the, and they don't have to be that big, but they create these moments that people remember. Do you have any think, other thoughts on that? Well, I just think, I think that, that ending on a positive note, I mean, the moments, moments yes. thing is so interesting. And, you know, I think, I think different groups, different, different personalities, you know, stuff happens in workshops, but if you, as you say, if you can sort of plan little things, I always think you've got to leave on a high, right? Even yes. if, 
you haven't quite got to, I mean, this probably never happens with you, Brittany, but sometimes when you're in complex strategy situations, you might not have got the exact answer that everybody wants. But even if we haven't got there, right, it's still an achievement if we've at least heard from everybody in the room, we've understood the issues involved, and we know now what next we need to go away and research or tackle next. Like, as you say, you've got to remind everyone, we couldn't have got here without getting all your brains in this room ready to go for what's next. And, and I think that ending on a positive is great because they walk out feeling like, whoo, that was crazy. But yes, we, we've made some progress. And if you don't, if you, I think you failed as a facilitator if you don't have that, that vibe isn't there at the end, like, uh, you yeah. know, we've, we've got somewhere. So yeah. I, think, I think you're right. But I, I love uh, I love some of the, the, those ideas on moments. So that's a no- lovely idea, buying people books, you know, giving little sweeties. Ah, oh, who doesn't like sweeties? Or yeah. candy. The sugar exactly. high to get them started. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Little, sometimes it is the simplest little things like little jelly beans or something that you can leave around the room and you know but bring it bring it into the workshop i, I used about, to do what about virtual um meetups or workshops yeah yes. how would you- this one is tougher but so what i always recommend when i'm coming in to facilitate a virtual workshop in terms of creating these moments is what you want to avoid is that people are like oh i'm in this long zoom meeting like all day or i mean i wouldn't recommend that you do a virtual workshop for a whole day but even if it's like a couple of hours right that's a long time for people to be like it on their screen. So what you want to make sure they understand is that we really value their time and that this is something a little bit special. So what I love to do, and you can do this on like all video conferencing, is that what you call it? Video conferencing software, like Zoom, every, basically anything you use. I like to have music playing at the beginning when everybody's coming in. So there's like some cool, funky tunes playing something kind of like, I mean, for me, it's going to be a bit nerdy and probably something <laughs> from like the 80s, 90s, whatever, right? Like something that people know and they're like, oh, so immediately when they, you know, walk in the room or join the call, they're like, oh, this is diff- this is different than what I usually, you know, usually you go in and it's like everybody's coming up and it's like, hey, oh, hi, hi, hi. Oh, you're on mute. You know, so it's like, let's create an uh, an experience that's a little bit different. So first thing, music is huge. Um, the other thing that I really like to do is um and I, and I, you know, give this advice to businesses. It's a super easy thing for you to do to be like, oh, our workshop is kind of like over lunch hour. Let's let everybody expense their lunch and like order in lunch to their house as like a special nice thing that we're going to do for you for saying, hey, thanks for joining us for this workshop and thanks for your input, right? Um, super simple, very cheap thing for companies to do and kind of hits that of like, oh yeah, cool. This is like a different experience. Um, So music, I love to really, I mean, I can't see a ton of it right now, but I love to have, like, I always stand when I'm doing workshops. And then I have a nice background that looks nice. I use um, like a real camera, not a webcam so that like people sometimes join and they're like, I feel like I'm watching Netflix. I'm like, perfect. That's exactly (laughs) how I want it to feel. Like I want it to feel special and that it's like, oh, this isn't just some chick coming in to run a meeting, like she is clearly a professional doing this, right? So I want to give them that impression. Also super important for like credibility, um, credibility from the team and people kind of trusting you is that you kind of look like you know what you're doing. And then I think virtual, like have fun with the tools, right? One of my favorite things like using Miro or Mural. So I mean, I still can't believe that they're called, they're both called that. Like, are you kidding? Anyway, it's (laughs) it's insane. But anyway, um, using those tools to, you know, to your advantage on virtual and virtual workshops is really fun. Like one of my favorite things to do. And I think this is actually like a, uh, a template on mural. Um, It's like where you get everybody to draw, like you get everybody to kind of draw themselves and then sort of, um, and it's like, it ends up being hilarious because of course everybody looks like, complete psychos right like you know because you can't draw properly on these tools right but it's very funny and you kind of say like draw yourself and and then you know in the context of sort of what you do at the business or on the team and then everybody explains it and it's a good laugh and everybody has fun and it's all about kind of yeah creating that sort of sense of this isn't just a meeting we're doing something special here it's that word experience. And we've said it a few times throughout this is creating that experience. And, you know, I, it's funny in these like Miro boards, uh, when you see like all these people's curses flying around the screen, uh, like post-it notes, it gets really crazy um, when that happens. So I'm just wondering how you manage energy. Cause we, that was something you, you mentioned around managing energy. Do you, 
if it's like a, you know, long day, how do you break it up? And like, what do you do to keep that energy up in yeah. virtual uh, workshops? The key, there's a couple of keys for sure. The, I, the, the fact that people need breaks more often in virtual mm -hmm. workshops, very, very important. The, the reason why virtual, like I during COVID, I really like dove deep into this. I'm like, why is it so exhausting being on these video calls all day? Like, what is that? And there's, of course, a couple of different reasons. Obviously, for our eyes, it's very difficult as well. But the biggest reason why it's so exhausting is that you don't get this the payoff that you would usually get with people in the room. So you're you're giving your energy and you're sort of like, um, you know, putting it all out there, but you're not getting the usual payoffs that you would like. And simple things like eye contact. It's impossible to have eye contact in virtual meetings, right? We can't actually look at each other's eyes. When I'm looking at Jacob's eyes, I look like I'm looking to the side, right? If I look straight <laughs> in the camera, it looks like I'm looking at you guys, but I can't see you. So we're not getting that eye contact um, that we're usually getting. We're not getting the body language, which usually we can feed off of. So it's like all of those elements are missing and therefore it's super exhausting. And especially as a facilitator, it's very exhausting. Um, so break, like once every hour is key. I encourage everybody on the breaks to stand, not to go and, you know, look at their email, but to stand up, open a window. If you can get outside, you know, for a second or two, super important. Um, also, your workshops cannot be as long as a virtual workshop. So what I really try to think about is like, what is what are the things that are key for, for us to actually be together for? And then what things can we actually do on our own time? Um, so when running like longer workshops um, over several days, I always have like two and a half hour sessions, which involve a break for sure, two and a half hour sessions, and then followed up with, here's your kind of like homework and the delivery that you need to have by the end of the day. So then everybody kind of like goes back and does that work on their own time. And then we come back together again, we look at it, we do the next thing. And then it's like, okay, and now here's your next step that you have to do. Cause usually in a, in a workshop, the way I like to run them, which, which ends up being very powerful for, um, for even introverted people who aren't really, you know, very vocal with their ideas. I want to make sure that everybody has the chance to kind of like, have a moment to think and work on their stuff. When you're in the room together, you can do that together. You, everybody goes quiet, you play some music, right? And everybody can work on their thing. But in virtual, it's a little weird. Like I don't I don't love the idea of like playing music and then us all like working huh. on our, like there, to me, I'm like, sometimes that works if it's a short activity, but if it's something where you need people to concentrate for 30, 45 an hour, like, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. So really planning your workshop strategically around that is really important. The music thing goes a huge mile. I love using energizers, like energizers throughout. So once we come back from a break, it's like, okay, cool. Super fast, fun energizers. On Honestly, some of the best, I think, energizers are virtual. I love the one where you get, there's a couple of them. You go get get people to find um, the a, a picture like in their office or wherever they are, like any picture, a physical picture, they're not on their phone. And then they come back and everybody kind of like shows them. And it's often like people's kids or their dog or whatever the vacation they went on. Cute, right? Easy and cute. Mm -hmm. One of my personal favorites also is getting everybody to run to the fridge and get their favorite snack that's currently in the fridge. And you always have like really weird stuff coming out of that one. And it's just funny, right? And then you get everybody to come back and whatever. And like, it's just so easy. You can get creative with these, but the key of for the energizer virtually is to get people out of their chair. You know, like if you really want to energize and it's not just an icebreaker, then make sure people get up and go and do something and come back, like get them to find their favorite sweater. Like it doesn't matter what it is. It always ends up being like kind of funny and fun. Final question, because we're coming to the end. Um, what do you think the future of workshopping is? I mean, um, before we came on air, if we can call it that, um, J Jacob um, mentioned that he'd done something in the metaverse, right, uh, a, a few few weeks back. What, what's your what's your thought on that? Do you think that could take off? Like, what, where, where do you think the future is? First of all, can I just get a really quick overview, Jacob, of that experience? Because I really am so curious about it. Yes, absolutely. So this was the first design conference in the metaverse. So they brought a number of speakers into the metaverse. 
the company that organized it, uh, they sent me a VR headset and Oculus Quest. Uh, and this is the first time I'd ever used it. I had, I'd played PlayStation with the VR headset, but this was a little different because it had controllers for your hands. So it was a, definitely a learning curve. It blew my mind away because it had this like mixed uh, reality. So you could like see through the goggles, but also interact with it. And like you're playing ping pong virtually and like throwing paper airplanes. So there's all these like crazy stuff I've never done before playing games in VR. Um, but it was, it was a learning curve, like how to teleport in the metaverse and like how to walk around in the metaverse and not run into things. So that was a learning curve. Um, however, the conference, you know, it, they set up, they custom designed a stadium, uh, uh, like an auditorium, not a stadium, uh, where people could sit. So all these people virtually could attend and go like portal into this auditorium. So everyone was like a, dressed up as a, their own avatar, right? So I had like bunnies and then like people in like gay pride uh, shirts and I, you can customize your own avatar. So I was at the front of the auditorium presenting while I was watching all these other like avatars in, uh, in the metaverse. So I presented on uh, how I built a brand in the Web3 space or in the NFT space uh, to this audience that were, you know, like techies because they were in, know in these uh techies nerds i don't know <laughs> yeah it was, yeah i felt like i felt like a bit of a geek in this thing but it was super super cool uh and it was it's a fun it was a fun experience uh for sure and i throughout this time i did also ch- um try various other um like um software i guess if you will or apps because there's different apps in different places you can meet in the metaverse there's not just one metaverse so it's like multiple right there's infinite numbers of them uh, and they all have you all have different um, styles of avatars. Like Facebook has Horizon Workrooms, and you don't have legs. And there's others that, that are well, they're building on that. <laughs> but there's there's different experiences. So it's um it's it's in its infancy for sure. But it is um you know it it looks promising. But I the the barrier to entry is the goggles, right? And like having these clunky things over your head. Um, so once that gets improved, I can see it being more useful. Um, but the thing is like, you're still staring into a screen at this point and it's really close to your eyes. So it can be even more draining than yeah. being on a computer, which, you know, you can do for a couple of hours, but this for like, even after an hour, like my eyes, you know, it was, well, I wasn't used to it and it was just like, yeah, it was, it takes some getting used to. So we'll see where things progress to. Yeah. I mean, so I think like, that's amazing and sounds like a really cool experience. Um, My answer is probably a lot simpler. I think that the future of workshops, the future of facilitation is just that people will like facilitation will become a skill that people are eager to learn and to figure, you know, kind of like incorporate in their career. Um, I think there will be like always sort of like, not not always, but like there'll be highly skilled facilitators who specialize in that. But also I think it's going to become a thing where companies are training up their people in facilitation and like, what can, what are the skills? What are the, you know, how can I just have like my manager team or my leadership team know how to run a really powerful workshop because honestly the the value is so high that it would be really silly I think if companies didn't invest in that so for me the future of workshops is just more workshops done by more people I guess Hey, brilliant. Well, on that on that um, rather positive note, thanks so much, Brittany, for coming in. It's been an amazing um, kind of time to, to spend with you talking about all of that. If anyone needs to or wants to kind of connect with you a little bit more, where is the best place for them to do so? So it would be either on LinkedIn or Instagram. I'm on both platforms very often. Um, and both of them are just my full name. Brittany Bowering is my kind of handle. So send me a message. I love to chat about this kind of stuff all the time. So yeah, thanks for having me, you guys. This has been great fun. Thank you. So many tips. I, I've got a, a whole page of notes just as you're listening. So thank you. It has been awesome. Thank you, Brittany. Take care of yourself. Thank you.